Good morning, beloved ones. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening or whatever time it is when you are watching us either live or on our YouTube channel. I want to welcome you to Palomar Unitarian Universalist Fellowships Worship into my backyard. We begin our services and our meetings at our fellowship with lighting a candle in acknowledgement of the land that we occupy. I am on the land of the Lusania Nation and the Kumeyaay Nation. Recognize that this is stolen land and work toward justice for all indigenous peoples. I invite you, if you would like, to make a practice of lighting a candle with us from home and learning about the land that you are on. I wanna thank all of our worship participants this morning. Kimberly Lilly, Emily Barker on tech, Holly Herring, Tim Evelsizer, Katya Hansen, Michael Muffson on tech. Um, we cannot do all of this without all of you. And there's no point in us doing all of this without all of you who join us on Sunday mornings or whenever you do. As we continue to build our connections with one another in this time of pandemic and still staying away and also in a time of such unrest. Our theme for this month is compassion. And what a time it is to consider compassion. This morning we'll have several explorations of that. And in the meantime, I invite you to breathe with me as I invite the bell. Once for those who've gone before, once for those who are with us now, and once for those who will follow after. This is a sanctuary for those seeking their own answers to questions of faith. We are creating a sanctuary for voices lifted up for justice and peace. We create a sanctuary for those seeking companionship in their struggles and their journeys. We create a sanctuary for the renewal of the spirit, a sanctuary for the renewal of the mind. I invite us into worship this morning with words by UU Seminarian of Color, Nathaniel Hawker. For lives that matter. Spirit of life. Life cracks that form in the walls of a building whose foundation was built improperly. Our country rests on that very same foundation. The cracks are wide and deep. We know that the mortar required is one with consistency of love and truth, acceptance and education, and when applied will yield healing. Guide us in this time of dissonance, this time of urgency. Ignite our hearts to listen to those who are continually unheard. Amplify our voices to convey a message of unity. Spirit of grace, we watched a knee of color taken in silent protest while the knee of white supremacy crushed innocent life spark in us the charge of connection that we might experience the blaze of relationship. Provide us with the tools we need that we may carve a new path forward away from the life-denying legacy of oppression. Move us from a place of comfort to challenges we never anticipated. A spirit of resistance lead us to fight for what is right, even when we grow tired or afraid. Remind us of the dream our ancestors had that one day we will all be free and live safely without the threat of brutality. Give us the courage to speak truth to power 
and hold our elected officials accountable, mold their hearts towards compassion and reform. May they abandon winning for justice as we fiercely proclaim Black Lives Matter until streams of justice flow. Amen. It is good to be together. Good morning, everyone. I invite you to have your chalice ready and light it with me as we do our chalice lighting words, please. <sighs> True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Spirit of light, come on to me, sing in my heart all the stirrings of compassion, blow in the wind, Rise in the sea, move in the hand, giving life the shape of justice. Roots hold me close, wings set me free. Spirit of life, come to me, come to me. Good morning. When I became a part of the Herring family as a teenager, I devoured books on Buddhism that Mickey Herring, who was like a father to me, loaned me. I started visiting temples everywhere in the country that I spent time. While I was living outside Tampa, Florida in 1992 and attending my senior year of high school, I discovered a small Burmese temple. I began spending time there with them and I learned quite a bit about Theravada Buddhism, which is a Southern school. I learned that there are probably as many different sects of Buddhism as there are of Christianity. I identified so strongly with the beliefs there that I took refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha in a ceremony in Tampa. When we take refuge in Buddhism, we commit ourselves to the Buddhist path. It's similar in commitment to a Christian baptism. When a person takes refuge, it is to the triple gem, which is what we call the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. The Buddha, who is an enlightened teacher, the Dharma, which is the teachings of the Buddha, which can be found in Buddhist writings sometimes called sutras, and the Sangha, which is the community of Buddhists. The monks and nuns in some temples will burn three incense cones on their shaved heads that leave a triangle of burn marks to symbolize the triple gem. I moved back to California after six months in Florida and I found myself back in the San Francisco Bay Area. I wanted to find a temple like the small one that I belong to in Florida, but what I stumbled on was completely different. I found a very large Mahayana Buddhist temple instead. This is a Northern school of Buddhism and there are slight variations in beliefs. I moved to San Diego County in 1996 and I quickly discovered what was to become my spiritual home for many years. Shifong Temple in San Diego. I joined the sutra studies there for the English speakers led by Tom Graham, who translated books that the master wrote in Taiwan. I chanted the Heart Sutra more times than I can count with the other English speakers. The Heart Sutra is the shortest sutra in that tradition as well as the most frequently used and recited. 
The Bodhisattva of compassion in male form is the main speaker in this sutra. The Heart Sutra teaches emptiness through the model of compassion. It is often said that, in a sense, emptiness is the heart of the Mahayana, but the heart of emptiness is compassion. The scriptures even use the phrase, emptiness with a heart of compassion. It is crucial never to forget that. The main reason for the Bodhisattva's presence here is to symbolize the aspect of compassion and to emphasize that we should not miss out on it. If we think we understand emptiness, but our compassion does not increase or even lessens, we are on the wrong track. The Heart Sutra goes a little like this. Gate gate, paragate, parasamgate, bodhisattva. Gate gate, paragate, parasamgate, bodhisattva. Gate gate, paragate, parasamgate, bodhisattva, bodhisattva. The English translation of that is gone, gone, gone beyond, gone utterly beyond. Gone, gone, gone beyond, gone utterly beyond. Gone, gone gone beyond, gone utterly beyond. Oh, what an awakening. Gate means gone. Gone from suffering to the liberation of suffering. Gone from forgetfulness to mindfulness. Gone from duality into non-duality. Gate gate means gone gone. Paragate means gone all the way to the other shore. So this mantra is said in a very strong way. Gone, 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 all the way over. And parasam means everyone, the sangha, the entire community of beings. Everyone gone to the other shore. Bodhi is the light inside, the enlightenment or awakening you see it, and the vision of reality liberates you. And sava is a cry of joy or excitement, like welcome or hallelujah. Gone, gone, all the way over. Everyone gone to the other shore. Enlightenment, sava. I visited the major temple, Shilai, in Hacienda Heights, for all the festivals and events, like the Buddha's birthday. I eventually went to school there at University of the West for Buddhist chaplaincy, and a whole bunch of knowledge about that particular Buddhism practice there was dropped on me. This was pure land in Chan Buddhism, which all falls under the umbrella of Mahayana Buddhism. This is when I really became fascinated with Guan Yin. I loved hearing about Guan Yin in the Lotus Sutra. Like the Heart Sutra, the Lotus Sutra is a very important text in the Mahayana tradition. It is said to be the teachings of the Buddha about how one becomes enlightened and ends their suffering. One of those ways, or paths, is the way of the Bodhisattva. I quickly learned that Guan Yin means the one who perceives the sounds or the worries of the world. She is the Bodhisattva of compassion. A bodhisattva is someone who comes very close to enlightenment, but she stays back until all have been freed from samsara, or the cycle of birth and death referred to as reincarnation, because she wishes to help everyone who calls on her for help. In Mahayana Buddhism, her typical appearance is that of a female in white robe she wears necklaces made up of beads like a rosary that turn symbolizing Guan Yin ending the cycle of rebirth for those that call out to her and leading them to Nirvana. In one hand, she holds a jar of pure water, which can relieve suffering. And the, in the other hand, she holds a willow branch. A willow branch is important because it will bend without breaking. Bending without breaking is a lot like adapting. She wears a crown upon her head that has an image of Amitabha Buddha, who was her spiritual teacher before she became the Bodhisattva. 
She sits on a pink lotus, which symbolizes peace and harmony. One really cool thing I learned about Guan Yin is that originally in Buddhism, all bodhisattvas were masculine. However, in the Lotus Sutra, we learn that Guan Yin, by result to a variety of shapes, travels in the world, conveying the beings to salvation. So by the 12th century, during the Ming Dynasty, that male bodhisattva magically transformed to a female form. This sounds really interesting to me as a feminist, until I discovered it really had a lot to do with China being a very patriarchal society, and women tended to be the gender asking for help from Guan Yin. So it seemed more appropriate for Guan Yin to take a female form to be more accessible to women. Now there's a story about Guan Yin that hits me really hard during these times. It's the story about Guan Yin realizing that there were so many cries coming from the world from beings who wanted to be saved from the cycle of rebirth and the suffering that it entails, that after hearing so many cries for help, her head split into 11 pieces. Amitabha Buddha then gave her 11 heads so that she could take in all those cries without her head splitting. But now, when Guan Yin heard the cries in her 11 heads, she immediately, compassionately reached out to hold all those that were suffering, and her two arms shattered. So Amitabha Buddha gifted Guan Yin with 1,000 arms so that she could hold everyone who cried to her. How many of you have felt like Guan Yin lately? I know I have. I hope to have 11 heads one day to take in all the cries of the world and 1,000 arms to hold the suffering. For now, I just have two arms and one head, and that'll have to do. Maybe if we all pitch in together to hear the cries and hold the suffering, we can be like Guan Yin. We can hear and hold all of our neighbors who are crying out our neighbors without homes, our neighbors who are abused and oppressed because of the color of their skin or their gender identity, our neighbors who suffer in silence, invisibly, our neighbors who struggle to earn a living wage, our neighbors who are treated unfairly because of their gender, a disability, or socioeconomic status, our neighbors who are incarcerated, our neighbors who are experiencing addiction. As it is said in a meditation from another school of Buddhism, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings rejoice in the well being of others. May all beings live in peace, free from greed and hatred. Thank you so much, Holly, for that beautiful reflection about Guan Yin. And this really ties in well to this next part. Obviously, we have a congregational covenant that we say each week together to share the values we share with each other and one another and how we want to be in our community. So I will begin and then you'll read with me as we get to the part we all do together. In mutual love and grace. We journey together grounded in profound respect for a diversity of beliefs and ideas, sustained by service and shared ministry, enriched through collective spiritual deepening, and a safe environment for all generations to thrive. And this is what we know. Together, we are more than we will ever be alone. Therefore, we promise to practice radical hospitality mindful communication, and active stewardship. Thus do we covenant with each other. Hush, hush, somebody's calling my name. Hush, hush, somebody's calling my name. Hush, hush, somebody's calling my name. Uh, 
us. Beloveds, I invite you to breathe with me. Breathing in and out, listening perhaps for that still small voice within, through and around us. Hush. Beloveds, in this time, we create a moment of space, a container for the cries that we hold in our own hearts, our own cries for the world, for ourselves, for our families, for those we love, for those we know, for those we don't know. invite you into that place of honesty and silence known by many names. Will you pray with me? Spirit of life, spirit of love, you move through us as intimately as our breath. This precious breath with us through all of our lives and you are with us in our last breath for those who are struggling to breathe from oppression, from virus, from fear or lostness or loneliness. May we take in ourselves compassion and bring forth compassion for the world. Spirit of life, spirit of love, in these shared moments, May we know ourselves connected each to each and with you, with the breath of life, Numa Ruha. In the beginning was the breath. Let the breath be the beginning of our prayer and the end of our prayer as we hold all that we have lost. We also hold all that we seek to birth, to birth into life with fresh breaths. Spirit of life, spirit of love, here we are. Here we are in this moment present to all that is, to sacred community, to love, and to faith, the faith in our ability to act from love, to come from love, a radical, inclusive love, spirit of life. We hush and we listen for our name. Amen. Hush. Hush. Somebody's calling my name. Hush. Hush. Somebody's calling my name. Hush. Hush. Somebody's calling my name.
once again. Hush. Hush. Somebody's calling my name. Somebody's calling your name. The song that Kimberly sang is an African-American spiritual that guided enslaved peoples in their struggles for justice. It was an embodied expression of knowing that they were guided by God, that they could hear, hush, their name being called, and ask, what shall I do? What shall I do? What shall I do? Freedom and justice, calling our names, calling your names. What is it, beloved ones, that we shall do? What is it that we are called to do in these moments? These moments of opportunity, these moments where there is justice calling our names, calling us to compassion, calling us to the possibility of a re constituted world. Can it be? Can it really, really be? And that's the question that this spiritual asks us. Can it really be? Pause for a moment with me and ask that question. Can it be? Can we hear? What is it that you hear in the moments of a silence? What is it that we hear in the cries around us? What is it that we hear that we so desire for? Hmm. Freedom and justice calling our names. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? I suggest today that we choose compassion, a fierce compassion that goes beyond empathy to action, which is part of what makes it embodied. And of course, it is embodied when we feel, when we feel not just for those who are suffering, but feel with those who are suffering. And in these times, beloved ones, there is so much. And I don't think I need to remind you of that. But there is so much suffering. There's so much up close and there's so much in widening circles. Hush. Do you hear the cries of the world? Could you yourself be a bodhisattva? One of my root teachers, Joanna Macy, suggests yes that we can all be bodhisattvas or bodhisattvas in training. I love the story that Holly told about Kuan Yin. And for a long time, I've been drawn to her and her many, many stories. She who sees and hears the cries of the world. Hush, hush. Somebody's calling and we are hearing. In each of these traditions here, the Christian tradition that hush comes out of and the Buddhist tradition, there are those that call, the one that hears, and those that responds. It is a call and response. And out of our love, we then become like the one who hears. I don't consider myself a Buddhist like Holly. I have Buddhist leanings. I find much wisdom and encouragement in what I know of Buddhism. And so you can imagine that it was a surprise to me to realize that I had found my way to this path without really intending to. It kind of snuck up on me. Years ago, I came across what I thought was just a short prayer. It's said to be a favorite of the Dalai Lama. For as long as space endures and for as long as living beings remain, may I too abide to dispel the misery of the world. I learned that it's part of a larger work 
called The Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life by Shantideva, an 8th century saint. And when I heard that little snippet, I thought, okay, there was something in those words, for as long as space endures, and for as long as living beings remain, may I too abide to dispel the misery of the world. There was something in those words that brought out a yes. And at first, it was as if I didn't have a choice. I just found the truth of it. It was like somebody calling my name. And then I found an even larger portion of it, a reading in a book of meditations. And that longing and that desire and that yes just welled up in me. And I'm still making my way with this since I'm agnostic in the matter of what happens to consciousness once this life ends. And what it did, did it mean if I was foregoing nirvana if I wasn't sure about it? I only knew and know that I have this one life and that the only thing I have wanted for this life was to end the suffering of all beings. And here was this figure, Kuan Yin, who represented that. And so I studied it and I studied the book, the whole long 10 chapters by Shantideva, and it guides my life. I saw the words embody fierce compassion on a banner at the All People's Climate March in New York six years ago now. And that brought out another yes, embody fierce compassion. That is at the heart of the vow. And these days, I delve into this fierce compassion that comes out of a deeply felt experience of not being separate from others. The writer Andrew Boyd gives us more context. Many of us have set out on the path of enlightenment. We long for release of selfhood and some kind of mystical union with things. But that moment of epiphany, when we finally see the whole pattern and our sense, our place in it, in the cosmic web, it can be a crushing experience from which we never fully recover. But that moment of epiphany, when we finally see the whole pattern and sense our place in the cosmic web, can be crushing. A crushing experience from which we never fully recover. He says, compassion hurts. When you feel connected to everything, you also feel responsible for everything. You cannot turn away. Your destiny is bound to the destinies of others. You must either learn to carry the universe or be crushed by it. You must grow strong enough to love the world, yet empty enough to sit down at the same table with its worst horrors. To seek enlightenment is to seek annihilation, rebirth, and the taking up of the burdens. You must come prepared to touch and be touched by everything in heaven and hell. I am one with the universe and it hurts, he says. There is a lot there. Now, whether one is seeking rebirth, believe me, you know this, the practice of compassion will break your heart. And once we see, we cannot turn away. And it is as if when George Floyd was murdered by the police, there was a seeing from which people have not been able to turn away. And that's where compassion hurts. Now Boyd says we feel responsible for everything. I wanna tell you, you don't have to do everything. You do what you can in your sphere, but we never ever look away. Your heart, will break for the oppressed, for George Floyd, for the taking of his breath 
and the taking of the lives of black people and indigenous people and people of color. This world will break your heart and the heart that's broken open can hold the world. And, and I believe this. Your heart will break for those who are so broken and soul sick that they take the lives of others. Whose humanity is abjectly absent. Fierce compassion does not mean assent or approval. It means feeling everything, including anger, which tells us that something is wrong and spurs us to action. It says no to injustice, to say black lives matter, to walk in the streets when we hear our neighbor crying and we respond. As people did just here in Shadow Ridge where I am, a block from our congregation, we're a first time organizer with three children, biracial children said, I have to do something and organized her first vigil. To the thousand people at least who marched through the streets in Vista on Saturday. In an excerpt from Shanti Devi says, may I be a guard for those who are protectorless a guide for those whose journey on the road, who journey on the road, for those who wish to cross the water. May I be a boat, a raft, a bridge. May the pain of every living creature be completely cleared away. May I be the doctor and the medicine. May I be the nurse for all sick beings in the world until everyone is healed. This particular passage was one that I held close to me when my ego felt that I wasn't being seen and heard in who I was. When I was being, when I was being persecuted to a sense. And I returned to this prayer and realized that I am not disconnected from any perpetrators. My universalist faith tells me that all are held in love, everyone. And in seeing in others who perpetrate harm, the very inability to know that and to feel that can invoke compassion. The rejection of love or the zealous unquestioning obedience to order and the orders, the implicit or explicit adherence to white supremacy is a tortuous thing. It is a soul sickness. And it would be disingenuous for me to say that I don't struggle with that. Having compassion for perpetrators of violence and hate at the highest levels of government and in the streets by police have, cannot compare to any minor thing that I have, may have suffered. But I come back to the Bodhisattva vow, which I realized in exploring this in this past week led me to my universalist faith, which is deeply rooted in radical love, in fierce compassion, and in an eyes wide open hope that asks, where is the pain? Where is the lostness? Where is the brokenness? Ruby Sales asked the question, civil rights activist and leader, Ruby Sales asks, where does it hurt? This is what leads to injustice, this lostness, this pain, this brokenness. And believe me, it doesn't mean that I don't fight injustice. I don't not fight it, but it means that my compassion leads me to do all that I can to stop the pain, to dismantle systems that cause the pain, to respond. And I think it seems that if I had 11 heads, they might be exploding right now. 
and that a thousand arms wouldn't seem like enough. But I have this one body with only these two arms and these two hands and this one heart, all of which can open wide enough to hold enough. I'd like to invite you into an embodied fierce compassion practice to enter into this practice of embodying fierce compassion by Megan Foley and Teresa I. Soto. Their work writes, the minister, Megan writes, Unitarian Universalist minister, Reverend Teresa Soto writes, all of us need all of us to make it. Teresa's known for this this profound saying, all of us need all of us to make it. Foley writes, I want you to use, to get used to those words. Make them your prayer, she invites us. All of us need all of us to make it. And this is why Unitarian Universalists support Black Lives Matter. Please take a moment to struggle, center the struggle for black lives in your thoughts. Foley invites us to say these words and I invite you to say them with me. All of us need all of us to make it. In a world where some of us are targeted for struggle and brutality, where others of us benefit and flourish, we pray all of us need all of us to make it. In a world where powerful people of ill will and indifference make us fearful for our safety and our futures, we pray all of us need all of us to make it. In the excruciating space that lives between seeing and naming, hearing and changing, we pray all of us need all of us to make it. Make a picture in your mind of someone you aren't very happy with right now. I'm going to repeat that, what Megan Foley asks us to do. Make a picture in your mind of someone you aren't very happy with right now. Look at their face in your mind and pray. All of us need all of us to make it. Unitarian Universalists believe that all of us need all of us to make it, Megan writes. This is why we are in solidarity with the movement for Black Lives today and every day. And she ends with amen. I invite you to pray that phrase one more time. All of us need all of us to make it. This is what it means for me when I think of Kuan Yin and hearing the cries of the world. You know, the love that my universalist foundation grounds me in, to hear the cries of the world and this incredible vow that says everybody. Now, whether or not those who have taken the vow, those of us will be doing that for lifetimes or just this one, I invite us to breathe into that possibility of hearing the cries of the world that all of us need all of us to make it and to use the breath of our bodies to make it be so. I love you. We gather each week to affirm this community. Part of this affirmation is acknowledging all that we share with one another, our time, our talents, and our resources. 
We live our values by sharing half of our undesignated collection with a local nonprofit organization. This quarter, the plate share goes to you rise the Unitarian Universalist Refugee and Immigrant Services and Education. URI's work is an important now as ever. If you are currently in a position to give, to continue making your pledge, or there are several other ways to do that, even in the midst of shelter in place. You can write a check and mail it to our office or check in with our office administrator to find out how to set up auto payments or pay through the database. Or it is easy to donate through text to give. See the instructions on the screen, or if that doesn't work, you can see the instructions in the chat. Thank you, Tim. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to all of you who are present and writing in the chat. I saw some, um, some questions and some folks wanting some of the readings that I did. I will make sure that you get them. And I know that there's someone who's present right now who's going to send me an email to remind me to do that. Because remember, it's Sunday morning. And I might not remember what happens on Sunday morning, other than the fact that we have been amazingly connected to one another. Friends, I have a couple of things that I want you to know and to be thinking about. Next Sunday, the 14th, is our congregational meeting, and it's happening at 1230. Emails have gone out about it. Another email will go out this week, letting you know how you can connect. You should have received um, ballots and uh, the budget for those of you who are members and the candidates for positions so that you can vote. And Emily, our amazing tech person, is going to make it so that everybody can vote. Those of you who are receiving mail-in ballots, please mail them in. This is the other thing that I want you to know, and that is that we will not be worshiping together at 10 o'clock next week. Instead, I invite you to worship with me and the Unitarian Universalist Poor People's Campaign Leadership Council as we present a service with the Church of the Larger Fellowship, which is our online church. Church of the Larger Fellowship worships at five o'clock Pacific time. If you're in another time zone, please do that, Matt. So we are going to worship next Sunday together via Zoom. And if that gets full, you can join by YouTube live stream. So we are going to worship together next week at 5 o'clock. We got that. I'm going to send out an email. I'm so excited about this beautiful service that we're putting together for our Unitarian Universalist community to connect us to the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival, and knowing that the campaign itself is an answer to the cries of the world. It's an answer to the cries of the oppressed as we address systemic racism, poverty, the war economy, and the militarization of our communities, the ecological devastation that disproportionately affects people of color, and this distorted moral narrative of religious nationalism. So join me and the UUA Poor People's Campaign Leadership Council for worship next Sunday at 5, not at 10, and 
come to the congregational meeting at 1230. How does that all sound to you? So we are indeed staying connected even as we stay away. Um, okay. AM. Is the question that it's 5 p.m. The service is at 5 p.m. next week. 5 p.m. Did I say a.m.? That would have been weird. Okay, great. 5 p.m. We're going to send out emails. Don't worry about it. How does all that sound? We got it? So that was a lot. And you're going to be getting emails. But it's important that you know. We're not going to be here at 10 next Sunday. We're going to be here at 5 p.m. I'm not going to be anywhere at 5 a.m. other than like right here is where my bedroom is, okay? And I want you to be resting and sleeping too. Okay, perfect. Ah, so take another breath. Find, look for all the other ways that we can connect in our community. And this is what I want you to hear. Okay, sorry. But I got one more thing to say. And that is, I want you to get, even though I said it once, you don't have to do everything. That the way to reading was that we hear everything and then we choose what we can do, how we can do it. And this is the other thing, beloveds. This is what I want you to know. Feel everything. We will feel grief. We will feel sorrow. That's what, we will feel anger. That's what stirs us. Embodying fierce compassion means that we feel it and that it moves us to action. Not every action in every Every place that calls us, believe me, I know the call of every action. But don't not feel. Don't think that you need to achieve some enlightened state of not feeling anything and dispassionately bestowing grace. That's not your job. Maybe bestowing grace, but not without feeling, okay? I hope that you can take that from this message today as well. And please join me in our chalice extinguishing words. Although we extinguish this flame, we carry in our hearts the light of truth, the warmth of community, and the fire of commitment until we are together again. Our closing song is Come and Go With Me. The song actually is of unclear origin. There are a couple of uh, places that say it uh, comes from the blues, uh, the blues jazz mixture. There are some others that say it's an African-American spiritual. And actually from the research that folks have done, they're not able to be able to pin it down. However, what does the blues do? It tells the truth about pain. It also is a call. And what do spirituals do but call us on? So Kimberly is going to sing. The words are in the chat. And I invite you to join us in singing where you are at. Well, join Kimberly in singing. The rest of us can sing, but just we won't be able to hear each other. But know that we're singing together. And remember what we do when we gather? When it comes to there is justice, we go, stomp our foot. And there, you got me? We ready, Kimberly? Let's sing. Come and go with me. Well, let's start in the right key. Come and go with me to that land. Come and go with me to that land. Come and go with me to that land. Where I'm bound, where I'm bound. Come and go with me to that land. Come and go with me to that land. Come There'll be freedom in that land, there'll be freedom. 
It was good to see the panelists singing, and I'm imagining those of you who were singing with us at home. I want to give a special welcome to the Reverend Sarah Gibb Millspa, who is our regional staff member who's joining us for worship. Panelists, wave to Reverend Sarah, who's been doing so much for us. We love you, Reverend Sarah. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. Um, and go in peace, be makers of peace. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti.